Good morning, family. Hey, it's good to be with you. This may well be the strangest Good Friday you've ever experienced. Normally, as a family, we get together on a, a Friday morning or down to the um, Presbyterian Church uh, and we gather around the cross or we'll do something very quiet and reflective. Maybe we're in church and then the room's darkened and there's imagery around that helps us think about just what it cost Jesus to die for our sins. And uh, we can't do that. We can't be together this morning. But I want to tell you God's present. And God honours the fact, he loves the fact that you put him first. And you just come together in this way with us this Good Friday and celebrate Good Friday. I want us to pray for I open the word this, this morning. Um, I want to really believe that uh, even though the world's not recognising Easter, there's nothing on TV, there's nothing on the secular programs at all, only on Shine. But if we love on the Lord and if we pull together and declare his name publicly, then folk are going to come to know him this Easter. Let's pray. Father, we'd rather be meeting together and having hugs and greeting each other right now and thinking of your greatness and singing songs and hymns that remind us of your awesomeness and your power. But we can't do that. We're in lockdown and it's okay because you're here with us too. Father, in our bubbles this morning, as we look at the sermon, as we look at the, the posts that are there on the website, uh, Lord, as we do some family stuff together, may Jesus, you be central. And may we again be, just be in awe of how good you are and how kind and generous you've been in sending us Jesus. Lord, we ask that you'd open up the word to us, that no matter how long we've walked with you, we'd gain something fresh this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we come to our passage this morning, Mark 15, 35 to 47. I want to just help you to picture the scene. It's mid-afternoon. And an eerie darkness has covered the land. And it feels strange. It feels weird. I don't know if you remember what it was like just a few months ago when the Aussie fires were burning. And one day, uh, for most of the day, the sky turned sort of an orangey, hazy colour. And it felt weird. The whole day it felt really weird. I imagine on this day, it was darker. And that, that eerie feeling, that weird, strange feeling was even greater. The land was covered with darkness, a kind of a, a cloak of darkness. Just in the same way that the Pharisees' hearts have been covered with darkness too. I look at those Pharisees and I think about them sometimes and think, how could it be that they knew of stories of miraculous healings and the blind seeing and demons being cast out and the feeding of the 5,000 and all these things which were well known and well talked about in that time. How could it be that at Good Friday they would say crucify him? How could it be that they would be hell-bent on having Jesus killed? And my conclusion is that I think when people are jealous, I think when people are full of pride, I think when people are all about um, getting recognition, I think when people are all about keeping their sins and not having to give up on them, uh, you can give them lots of evidence for the cross, lots of evidence for Jesus, but they won't see him. I don't think those Pharisees wanted to meet Jesus. I don't think they desired to discover who he was. And so no amount of evidence could do that. There was not only a darkness in the land, there was a darkness over their eyes spiritually, a darkness that they'd chosen. On that day, from the cross, Jesus cried these words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthan. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the only time in Jesus' life where you can hear terror in his voice. The storms didn't bother him. In fact, he just slept right through them. The lepers didn't bother him. In fact, he reached out and he touched them. But when your sins and my sins and the sins of humanity were placed on him and the father turned his back to him and he wasn't in communication with the father, he wasn't aware of the father's presence for the first time in existence, that utterly terrified him. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? There's quite a number of people gathered around the cross that day. And maybe, maybe those who understood the Old Testament may have picked up this phrase. 
It's mentioned in Psalm 22. It's the beginning of Psalm 22, the same phrase, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And I think Jesus said that for a whole lot of reasons. One, because he was terrified. He couldn't feel the Father for the first time in his life. Our sin had separated him from God the Father. But also, by mentioning this phrase from this clearly messianic psalm, it gave people a clue, a heads up, as to what was really going down that day, that Jesus was there as prophesied, dying for their sins. Did they get it? Did they get the heads up? The psalm that described crucifixion so incredibly well, uh, a couple of thousand years before it was even invented. They get the clue, they get the hint, not at all. Look at these words, uh, verses. Verse 35. Some other people standing there heard Jesus and said, He's calling for Elijah. One of them ran and grabbed a sponge. And after he had soaked it in wine, he put it on a stick and held it up to Jesus. The wine would act as a pain suppressant. When Jesus cried out, uh, someone thought he was calling for Elijah the prophet. And so they went and got a sponge soaked in wine. Sometimes we read that passage and we think, well, I wonder if they're doing that out of compassion, giving them a pain suppressant. I don't think so. The scriptures tell us that it wasn't out of a compassion, but out of a morbid curiosity that the wine was given. This person said, let's wait and see if Elijah would come and take him down. We're going to prolong Jesus' death. We're going to ease the pain and not to help him, not to show love for him. But just in case Elijah comes and something really weird takes place. Some kind of a freak show. Jesus shouted and then died. And in the other Gospels, you have the words he shouted, the three most famous words ever spoken. And they weren't make my day or anything else like that that we've had in the last 20 years. They're amazing words. It is finished. It's finished. Now, some people read that and they think, oh, Jesus is going, oh, it's finished. I don't think so at all. As Jesus hung on that very tree, on the wood that he created, as he was pinned to that timber on that wood, had his hands not been pinned, I think he would have said the words like this, it is finished, it's finished, I've done it, I've completed my purpose. Satan had tried to derail him for 33 years, tried to tempt him to do wrong things for 33 years. People, even friends, had tried to put him off going to the cross. He stayed the course. He, he did the work. He completed the work the Father had set for him to do that. He had chosen to do from before the beginning of man's existence. It's finished. <laughs> it's just finished. It's finished. He's done it. He's completed it. Nothing else needs to be done. I don't notice, friends. I don't know if you've noticed, friends, as you read these passages about Good Friday and what took place and the suffering and the pain. They're not very explicit. In fact, most gospel writers talk about the crucifixion in this way, in just one or two sentences, something like, and Jesus was crucified with two robbers, one on his left and one on his right. Years ago, we all saw the passion of the Christ. And we've often sat and thought and reflected on Good Friday about the pain and the, the suffering. We know that he was marred beyond recognition. Pilate had to say, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. They couldn't tell that was Jesus at all. His body was just, it was horrible. It was, it was beaten up beyond recognition. And yet in the Gospels, as the Holy Spirit inspires the Gospel writers to record, they saw in what they heard. There's nothing elaborate. There's nothing of the gore and the pain and the suffering and the hours it took, uh, the beating, the spitting, the the agony that went on for hours. It's simply, and Jesus was crucified uh, with two robbers that day, one on his left, one on his right. Why is that? I think that God didn't want people to dwell on the gore or have an emotional response to the cross. Here's the facts. Now you weigh up the evidence and you make an intelligent uh, faith response to what Christ has done. Jesus shouted these words and then died. At once the curtain in the temple tore in two from top to bottom. Now I want you to just picture this curtain. History books tell us it was 
centimeters thick. 25.4 centimeters thick. And when this curtain was hung, it took 400 priests to hang it. That's how heavy it was. And this curtain separated the common man from the Shekinah glory of God, the Holy of Holies. And only once a year could a, a priest go into that presence. And he was so terrified, those priests, of dying when they went into God's presence. God's presence was separated off from common people like you and me by this huge curtain, 25.4 centimetres thick. Phenomenally heavy. And when Jesus died and when he cried those words, it is finished, I've done it. The work is completed. God ripped that curtain from top to bottom. What was he saying when he ripped the curtain? I believe this, friend. God was saying, the house is open. It's done. It's finished. The price has been paid. You can come in. Most amazing picture of God saying, from this moment forward, you can come in and enjoy the presence of God. You can come and talk to God and know that he's hearing your prayers. From this moment forward, the house is open. It's finished. The curtain is ripped apart. You can come into the presence of God. Family, as I looked at the Good Friday passages uh, for this week, as I thought about this message this morning, I couldn't help but think how often people try and sew up the curtain again. You see, we look at grace and we look at the cross and we go, wow, oh, that's good, that's brilliant, that's amazing. So I just I just believe and I repent and get baptized and what I receive the Holy Spirit and really God's doing everything. It's finished on the cross and I'm saved and I get to love on God and be loved by God and come into his presence. It's too easy. And people think that all the time. And so they add to grace. They come along and say, you know what? If you want to be a real Christian, if you want to really get in the presence of God, boy, yeah, you need to pray for two hours a day. Your yeah, worship life needs to be amazing. You need to read the right Bible translation and go to church on a particular day in the week. And, and they add these things to grace. It ought not to be. They try and sew up the veil because it seems that it's too easy to know the Lord and to meet the Lord. It seems unfair that God did everything through Jesus. And we just get to enjoy. And so people try and start the veil. And they did it straight away. As soon as the early church began, they began to do it. The Apostle Paul speaks about those Judaizers, those, those horrible people. And he uses words to describe them that are so harsh that I would struggle to say them. Because Galatians he refers to these folk. These folk come along and they're Hebrew Christians. They've been converted to Christianity. And after a short period of being a Christian, they go to churches where they are not Hebrew in origin, they're Gentiles. And they say to these churches, if you're a true Christian, if you really want to know God and be part of his family, you must be circumcised. They add to grace. If you're a true Christian, you need to do this as well to be in God's family, to come into his presence. You need to add to grace. You need to be circumcised. And when Paul wrote about these people, he used some of them harshest language in the whole Bible. Words that I would struggle to say, to speak out loud or to put pen to paper. Don't add to grace. Don't let people tell you to sew up the curtain. Don't think because Christ did it all and you can experience his love and presence daily, continually, in spite of how good or bad you think. Don't add to grace. Don't sew up the veil. It's human nature to sew up the veil again. It's finished. The job is done. The curtain's been torn. You and I can come boldly into his presence. Not because of how well we've behaved. Not because of how good we've been or how hard we've tried and how kind we've been. How many scriptures we read this week. But purely because on the cross, it was finished. The veil was torn. The house was open. A Roman officer was standing in front of Jesus. When the officer saw how Jesus died, he said, this man really was the son of God. When he saw how Jesus died, the centurion came to fame. Now, most of you will know centurions were men's men. They were fighting men, proven fighting men. They were hard men. They were highly respected men. 
And when this man saw Jesus' suffering, he would have heard the stories about healings and miracles and walking on water and feeding 5,000. He would have heard all of that. He would have been aware of the triumphal entry a few days earlier. But when he saw Jesus' suffering, he came to faith. When he saw how Jesus suffered, he came to faith. I want to say to your friends that there are often times when you and I who love the Lord go, Lord, why are you letting me go through this? God, you, you control all things. You have all power. You created the heavens and the earth. Uh, why are you letting me go through this redundancy or this suffering or this sickness or this relational problem? I think sometimes, even though God doesn't send those things, he allows it so that people can watch how we suffer with faith. I cannot tell you the number of times I've heard that Christians have been through a difficult time and non-Christians have gone, wow, their faith must be real, God must be real. There's a famous story going way back to the 1800s, 1873. A priest by the name of Joseph, Joseph Damien out of Belgium went to a leper colony called uh, Malachi. And in this leper colony on this island of Malachi, uh, he chose to serve these lepers who'd been isolated there on the island. Uh, week after week, he preached up a storm. He loved on people. He was out there evangelizing. And for week after week, for 12 years, no one came to faith. And in fact, when he met for church, no one came to his church services. After 12 years, Joseph Damien was on the dock. He was getting ready to catch the ferry to go back to the mainland, to leave the colony. He had totally failed. He was totally dejected. He felt, wow, this witnessing, this evangelizing it's so flippin' hard i'm a failure and as he stood on the dock he looked down at his hand and he saw some strange looking blotches there and a smile burst out across his face he had leprosy he couldn't go back to the mainland and so went back into the village and it became known that joseph damien father damien had leprosy after one week of that information getting out there were 400 people in church on Sundays. The revival broke out in that island. Why? Because they related to him. They saw his suffering and they saw how he acted with faith in suffering. And because of how he suffered, they came to faith. In the same way, the centurion, this man's man, this hard man, comes to faith because he sees how Jesus suffers. When you and I go through a hard time and they come our way, not because we've done something bad, not because God's out to punish us, but because we live in a fallen world, because there is freedom of choice and people can hurt us. When you go through those times, you can't choose to avoid them, but you can choose how you respond to them. And if you keep close to the Lord, and if you keep loving on the Lord, more people can come to faith during your times of suffering and struggle than they can during your season of ease and of comfort. Verse 14, 41. Some women were looking on from a distance. They'd come with Jesus to Jerusalem, but even before they had been his followers and had helped them uh, while he was in Galilee, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of the younger James and of Joseph were two of these women. Salome was also with them. There were women that boy, just served the disciples and Jesus wherever they went. They were part of the inner circle. Uh, they prepared meals. They washed feet. They were just there supporting, caring, learning, hungry to learn about the kingdom from the master. And the woman were the last people with him at the cross when he died. And these women were the first people to see him at the tomb when he rose. Verse 42. It was now the evening before Sabbath, and the Jewish people were getting ready for the sacred day. A man named Joseph from Arimathea was brave enough to ask Pilate for the body of Jesus. Joseph was a highly respected member of the Jewish council. And he also was waiting for God's kingdom to come. Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus was already dead. And he called in the army officer to find out if Jesus had been dead very long. And the officer told him, Pilate uh, let Joseph, and so Pilate let Joseph have Jesus' body. Joseph brought a linen cloth and took the body down from the cross. He had it wrapped in cloth and he put it in a tomb that had been cut into solid rock. Then he rolled a big stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, 
were watching and saw where the body was placed. I want you to just think about Joseph of Arimathea for a moment. He'd been a secret disciple. He'd been a follower of God, of Jesus, for a long time. He'd been waiting for the kingdom. He's, he was on the Sanhedrin, so it's the Supreme Court of the day. He had prestige. He had a good income. He had a good job. He had mana in society. And he hadn't been overt. He'd kept it secret, the fact that he loved the Lord. He kept it secret, the fact that he was following this rabbi from Galilee. And I kind of understand why he kept it secret. Because up until this point, he realized that the, to make it public that he loved Jesus, that he wanted to follow the Lord, would cost him everything. You cannot be on the Sanhedrin, on the Jewish Council Supreme Court, and say, I follow the rabbi, uh, the, the way, this Jesus from Galilee. To align himself with Christ would have cost him his job, would have cost him his mana, uh, it would have cost him everything. And so he kept it secret. Oh, I'll just sort of hope people recognize from my actions that I'm a Christian. He wasn't overt, he didn't declare, he didn't speak about the Lord. And up until this point, that made no difference for the kingdom of God. But there came an hour, there came a time in Joseph's life where he thought, I'm going to nail my colors to the mask. I'm no longer going to be a secret Christian. And boy, to go to Pilate and to ask for the body of Christ, that was absolutely saying, I love this guy. I follow this guy. I believe in this guy. I mean, that's that's putting it out there. To touch a dead body would mean to be banned from going into the temple to start with. Without a doubt, he would have lost his job. He would have lost his income. He would have lost his prestige and community. And there's a possibility in that season and time that if you were known to be a Jesus follower, you might have even been beaten up or possibly even lost your life. Up until this point, he kept his love for Christ secret. He was a secret follower. Boy, I'm sure he was kind and polite and he loved on people. It didn't really make much difference. There was no words to go with it, no declaration. There was no public overt declaration that he was a Christian. But at this point, he asked, he bravely asked for Jesus' body, and braver was. And I don't know what happened to this man. He exposed himself to tremendous persecution for doing what he did. It cost him so much. It cost him uh, his job, for sure, his ability to go into the temple, for sure. It would have cost him a lot of money to embalm Jesus and, and give Jesus his own grave, hewn into a, into a rock. I mean, that's expensive stuff. Could have cost him his life. You know, friends are a lot of people. A lot of people in Christianity today go, you know what, I'll just, I won't tell people I'm a Christian. I won't talk about God overtly. I won't say simple things like, hey, God bless you, I'm praying for you. Those things that kind of sow seeds that change lives. I just love on people. They'll just be nice people. Secret Christians. And I honestly believe, friends, that secret Christians have very little impact on the world. Always faith involves speaking. Always. That's what Jesus did. That's what his kids do. But there came a time, there came a season when Joseph said, I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to declare to the world I love Christ. And I would pray for any secret Christian watching this that you'd put it out there too. You'd be brave enough to tell people that you are a Christ follower, that you're a follower of the way, a follower of Jesus, and you begin to witness to people with words about who he is. When I look at this story, when I read this historical account, friends, there's a fresh sense of several things in my spirit. First of all, I want to be a secret Christian. I don't want to be just another nice person like a Rotary Club member or a Lions Club member. Wonderful people. I want to be a Christ follower. And that involves words. I want to put my nail my colours to the mask. And that might mean at times somebody uh, is rude to me. Somebody mocks me. Somebody calls me an egg, maybe. Do that. I believe even if it costs you, even if it costs you jobs, if it costs you friendships, if it costs you reputation, even if it costs you, I promise you this, friends, if you nail your colours to the mask and you let people know who you believe and who you're following, you will never regret that looking back. Never, ever regret it. It might be hard at the time. It might be challenging at the time, but you'll never look back. And regret that decision. But the thing that stood out to me most about this passage for this Good Friday is this. We're living in a world 
it says grace is too cheap. I don't think it is. It costs Jesus everything. We're living in a world that says, well, that's because we're so bright and clever. Let's add to grace. Let's add um, different things people have to do. Let's add works. Let's add energy. Let's add uh, effort, human effort to grace. Let's add rules and regulations from the Old Testament. Oh, you must worship on Saturday. You must do this. You must do that to grace. If you're a true Christian. Those words of Paul to the Judaizers, the, the ones who said you must be circumcised in the book of Galatians, that those words of Paul are so harsh, but I think reflect the heart of God. It's finished. The work's been done. The veil's been ripped apart. Come in and enjoy his presence through faith, through faith alone. This Good Friday, friends, the thing I feel the Holy Spirit saying to me and Encourage me to say to you is this, don't sew up the veil. Just enjoy his presence and his goodness. Don't add to grace. Just enjoy. The job's been done. The work's been finished. The price has been paid. It is finished. Jesus says, come in and enjoy my company. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we remember this day, the three most famous words ever spoken. It is finished. And Lord, it is. And Lord, we accept those words as true. Help us not to add to grace. Help us not to add to the good things you've done and what you've achieved. Lord, we thank you that you lived those 33 years, tempted in every way that we are, but without sin. Thank you, God, that you were worthy uh, to pay the price. To, to buy back our, our souls, to redeem us, Lord, to be connected with the Father again. Father, this Easter weekend, give us a fresh revelation of grace, of your undeserved kindness and goodness toward us, and help us just enjoy your presence. Help us come into the Holy of Holies and walk in the Shekinah glory of God purely and only because it's been finished and the work's been done. In Jesus' name, amen.